Radio personalities come and go. Some of them leave impressions that last a lifetime. Join us tonight as we host two of the three members of the trio that rocked the house on Montreal Radio for many years. Stay tuned for an absolutely blazing show right here on Rob's Inner Circle. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Kim Rossi, and I'm the next guest on Rob's Inner Circle. Hi, I'm Ted Bird, and I'm the next guest, along with Kim Rossi, on Rob's Inner Circle. Don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are. We'll be right back. I mean it. Stay right where you are. Don't make me come over there, because I will. <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Rob's Inner Circle, broadcasting live on my personal Facebook page on the Bobby Short Shorts YouTube channel and on the Rob's Inner Circle Twitch account. Thank you to everyone for tuning in to what is going to be an absolutely exhilarating show. We have some fantastic guests, so don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are, or else Ted's going to come and get you. The usual shout-out goes out to my good friend and producer of Rob's Inner Circle, Miss Jenny Duhame. And another shout-out to my other good friend, our podcast techie, Patty Saragosa. Thank you, girls, for being there and for making this show as great as it is. We have a shout-out, and the, the shout-out is to the Heavy Metal Rings, which is set to launch this year, and it's a nonprofit initiative like no other. All profits go to mental health initiatives and charitable organizations of each musician's choosing. So how can you help? Well, if you're a musician, just donate your used guitar strings. And if you like the final product, it'll be available. You can buy it a little bit later on. For information, just check out the email at the bottom of the page and you can get all your info over there. Just a reminder, folks, that we have our merch page up. It's up and running. And this, this is thanks to the collaborative effort of our good friend, Vincent Gargano. So if you want to get our collectible items, quality items at great prices, you can go to 514brandingco.com. We urge you to go on to the Bobby Shorts YouTube channel. That's Bobby Short Shorts, by the way. It was called Bobby Shorts. It's been changed. It's Bobby's Short Shorts. That's a YouTube channel. You can go on there and you click on the playlists and you can go pat and watch all our previous podcasts and our Daily Struggles sitcom. You can get all the episodes there. And what you want to do is go ahead. You want to comment. You want to give us those blue thumbs and give us those likes. You want to subscribe and you want to hit that notification bell because you'll be the first to know every time a new production goes up. Well, guys. It's it's the weekly ritual once again. It's time to sit back, relax, let out the bad air, just stretch out, sit back and enjoy, and let us carry the load. It's showtime. It's time to bring on our guests. Ladies and gentlemen, these two guests helped shape the map in Montreal. They were on Shom FM radio. And they were the sweethearts of every Montrealer. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome our hometown heroes, Ted Bird and Kim Rossi. Hi. Hey, guys. Thanks very much for coming on to Rob's Inner Circle. Such an honor. Well, how do you say no to uh, an invitation from two guys named Bobby Shorts and Vinny Gargano? <laughs> That's pretty convincing, huh? I always had that sales pitch in me anyway. <laughs> Vinny the Hat Gargano. There you you's go. You're going to be on the podcast, right? <laughs> yes, Vinny, we'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thanks so much. Hey, how you been doing? Uh, Kim, how you been doing? I'm good. It's, uh, it's funny you mentioned a mental health organization that you're supporting with your podcast. And I run a children's mental health organization, or the foundation anyway, uh, called Pathstone in Niagara. So that's what I'm doing now, my radio afterlife. But I also take care of all their PR and comms stuff. So it, it's still a good fit. 
So we're going to have a chance to talk about that because we have a long haul ahead of us. And uh, how about you, Ted? How you been keeping busy? I know you're on the jewel. You're still very active as a radio announcer. Besides that, what have you been doing to be uh, a little busy? Well, I'm, uh, you know, as my friend Stephen Henry, the uh, two-time New Brunswick Hog producer of the year, says, I'm still looking at the potatoes from the top down. <laughs> Well, wow. so, any anything else is a bonus. Mm -hmm. um, I don't do, you know, I mean, when you get up in the middle of the night to go to work, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't leave a whole lot of time for anything else. Really, I come home, I nap, I get up, I eat, I go back to bed because I got to get up at three thirty in the morning. I mean, you know, I spend time with my kids, and I, you know, I go to the pool, and I, uh, you know, I, I keep busy. I'm not bored. Let's put it that way, but. Mm -hmm. uh, as Kim will tell you, it, uh, that early morning schedule dominates your lifestyle. I, I loved when people would say, oh, so what do you do all day? I'm like, well, yeah. <laughs> when you're up in the middle of the night, you don't do much. Maybe exercise. And, and as Ted mentioned, have lunch, uh, take a nap, get up, have dinner, maybe see family. And you're back in bed by around like 8, 30, 9 o'clock sometimes. Yeah. Golfers, golfers always say to me, man, that's great. You got the, why, why don't you golf? Well, A, I don't even want to do something I like for five hours. And B, uh, I'd fall asleep out on the course. That's, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, well, it's just that's the way it is when you get up in the middle of the night. People say you must get used to it. No, you know, your body's not made for getting up in the middle of the night. And you know what's interesting? We might have had this conversation in the pre-interview that we did last week. Uh, I think I think we did, Kim. We were talking about how many... How many longtime morning radio announcers can you name who live to a ripe old age? Did we have that conversation? Yeah, we did. And, and you Wally mentioned Wally Crowder, Crowder, and I looked it up after. He did live to 92. Yeah. Wally Crowder was the uh, the longtime morning man at CFRB in Toronto. Yeah. Um, but other than him, uh, there aren't a whole lot. You know, most of them, a lot of guys who uh, who got up in the middle of the night and came in and did the morning gig uh, for, for decades – uh, yeah. They were gone before they were 70 years old. With a lot of them, it was lifestyle, though. Um, you know, a lot of them, a lot of them didn't go to bed at 8:30 at night. Right. You know, they'd roll from the bar right straight into uh, right straight into work, and that'll uh, that'll catch up with you. It will. Yeah. Well, I was, uh, you know, and and you were. He's a mutual friend of ours, Steve Anthony, who did morning TV, morning radio, all kinds of things for so so long. Um, it does catch up to you. And eventually you either make a lifestyle change so that you can get a bit of that quality of life back or you just stick to it because it's what you know and what you love. I, I eventually left for, you know, that change in scenery. I wanted to see different parts of the day awake. Yeah. I think Steve and I are probably the only two guys who are still as handsome as ever, despite getting <laughs> right? out of the middle of the night. Right? <laughs> and humble. Absolutely. And he had a birthday like on the 2nd of April. So he's in his 60s now. Yeah, as am I. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, what are you going to do? Holy old crow. Yeah, time goes on. So so you two uh, absolutely, like I was saying, helped shape the lives of many. And I'm one of the people that you really, you've touched my life very much. I remember I was a city bus driver for 31 years and I was on the uh, morning shift. And I remember I'd have uh, Show Me FM and at 7.15, it was... That time, it was when the revisionist history came on. And I remember, Kim, I can still remember, uh, it was something about the North Korean leader. And the joke, the way it was said, it just, uh, you were absolutely hysterical. You were uncontrollable. You were laughing. The show went off. You were still laughing. I think you were laughing for two days. Uh, awesome. and, and when the joke translator, folks, if you remember the joke translator, that was John Moore. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely, he just like complimented the whole revisionist history. When he came out and gave his translation of the joke, uh, I, I think some people must have passed out. I remember my bus, I had uh, just about everybody laughing. So, Ted, you're, you're best remembered on show for the revisionist history. Can you tell us a little bit what inspired you to come up with this uh, segment on show? Well, uh, for many years, uh, I would hear um, announcers do... Uh, Today in history, they'd, they'd rehash what happened on this date in history. And I found it pretty dry and boring. And I thought, you know, how about putting a twist on that? How about making stuff up, you know, and calling it today in revisionist history? So that's what I started to do. And I, uh, 
when I started it, it was it was pre-internet or or just around the time that the internet first came around. So I didn't have the resources that I have now. So I really had to really had to rack my imagination and think. And Blair Bartram, one of our old program directors, he found a book. I don't know where he found it, but it was a big binder of uh, historical events, like dates and historical events. And then as the internet took hold, it became a lot easier um, because you can find all kinds of, of uh, this date in history uh, websites on the uh, on the internet. Uh, some are better than others. And, uh, you know, over the years, I've been doing it now for I think over 25 years and over the years I've got, I got a stockpile of about, I, I don't even know, at least a thousand of them. And uh, sometimes I'll write a new one and sometimes I'll just, I'll just scroll through and find one that I haven't used in, in four or five years and uh, just go with that again. I mean, you know, if Jerry, if Jerry Seinfeld and, uh, and, and all the other big name stand up comedians can become multimillionaires by telling the same jokes every night, I can recycle one every four or five years. <laughs> For sure. So, Ted, over the years, you were saying, like, you lost count. So we tried to figure out how many, how many, how many of these uh, revisionist history skits you had. And you were saying easily, easily, at least 2,000? Well, I, yeah, I'd have to count them. But I would say somewhere in the four figures, well over 1,000, somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you figure I've done uh give me four weeks holidays a year so that's 48 week times 48 weeks times five which is almost 200 a year for 25 years so i mean that's how many times i've done the feature but like i say i've recycled i've recycled the jokes uh over the years the good ones the bad ones go in the trash but the good ones all recycle i remember remember one time kim um Ted had said a joke, something that, you know, was like a little bit religiously inclined and you hit under the desk because you were sure that it was a lightning coming through the building. <laughs> Possible, yeah, for sure. I, I had a good oh, laugh that, that. That happened this week on the Jewel. I did a couple of, uh, I did a couple of Easter revisionist history jokes. Oh, no. <laughs> One was um, Judas took his own life after taking his 30 pieces of silver and losing it all in blackjack at Harrods of <laughs> Nazareth. Oh my and, God! And uh, then today was um, <laughs> Jesus came back from the dead, and the disciples weren't buying it, so he put on a little magic show. He sawed Mary Magdalene in half, and uh, he did a few card tricks. But uh, he guessed that Thomas had picked the two of clubs when, in fact, Thomas had picked the five of diamonds. Hence the expression "doubting Thomas." Oh boy! <laughs> and I'm still here. No way. <laughs> you know why? Because Jesus would have laughed at that. <laughs> And then oh my made, God! Then he would have made some some fish and some bread and some wine, and we would have had a great old time. Oh my God! But do you get some kind of uh, let's see? Uh, are there you know some religious groups that get a little bit upset sometimes because it's very sensitive, eh? Well, it it can Maybe be. Now. I don't think it, not as not as much as it as it used to be. I don't think, and and you know that's like the people know that we're joking, right? And and. You know, those that's those are just that's pretty gentle humor, I think. That's pretty benign stuff. You know, if we if we put you know, if you take Jesus and put him in a some kind of a sexual scenario or criminal scenario or something like that, you know, there's a line, there's a line that you can cross. And I think the line's fairly obvious and 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 we don't cross it. So I've never had complaints from religious people. Most of the complaints I get these days are from people who think that I'm uh you know, that I'm not uh uh, rah rah, sis boom ba, on board enough for lockdowns and stuff like that. Like okay. you know, a smarmy, sarcastic, uh, you know, crack about lockdowns or masks or something like that. That's what people get upset about. That's okay. True. So, folks, we have a treat a little bit later on. We're uh, keeping it for the right moment. We're gonna. We have actually one of the uh, segments uh, that Ted put together. This was from K one hundred three. It was aired uh, last year. It's almost a year. It was a. Uh, May 25th, 2020. No, no, and no, 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 no. no? It was May, May 25th, 2010. Uh, 2010. Yeah. Well, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So we're going yeah, gonna... to, I haven't worked it. I haven't worked at K103 since 2012. So, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, anyways, the, there might be a little mistake. So give disregard to the date. But, anyways, we're going to be replaying that revisionist history clip. And, folks, uh, you, you guys are going to see the benefits of going to work and laughing. Uh, you know, spending the whole day laughing because look at Ted. He looks as young as, you know, like a, a schoolboy. 
So he's cool. always laughing and he's having a good time. Yeah. And this one, that, the, the one that Robert's talking about that he's going to replay, it could be complaint worthy. So uh, get, <laughs> your, uh, get your pen and paper out. <laughs> hey, you know what? <laughs> let's, let's hope for the best. <laughs> Hey, Kim, let's talk a little bit about you. Uh, tell us, uh, how did you get started off at Show My Fan? Because you're not from Montreal. You ended up here in Montreal somehow. So how did that happen? Yeah, so um, I was working in Toronto at, well, it was uh, Mix 99.9 and CFRB 1010 at the time. And I was doing afternoons with Steve Anthony, who you'd know from Show. He was He actually did Show Mornings after Howard Stern, I believe, all those years ago. Uh, for a short time. So he and I were doing afternoons. And then at the time, um, they were removing afternoon co-hosts right across the country at our company. So I was asked to go to mornings to work with Humble and Fred, who were coming in from The Edge. And so, or CFNY at the time, I guess. Um, so we did mornings there for a while. And at the time, um, I guess he was, yeah, he was my fiance at that time, uh, came from Calgary to Toronto so that we were in the same city. We were both in, in video and he wasn't really keen on Toronto. So he had talked to our owner at the time, Gary Slate, about a transfer. And he said, well, actually, I need some help with our rock programming out in Montreal. And that's what Bob's specialty was, was rock programming. And uh, so we transferred out from Toronto to Montreal. And that's how I joined Shom. It was kind of, we were a, uh, we were a package deal at the time. Okay, so you started off, you were doing, I believe, was it the news or the weather on Shome? I was doing news on Shome and entertainment. And then kind of gradually worked into uh, the third part of the, being the third part of the show. Because initially, it was Terry, Ted, and Thumbs. And Thumbs was the producer. And I was coming in just to do news and entertainment and add a little bit, but not much. And then eventually, it became more of a fuller role when Thumbs retired. To build houses. Oh wow! Okay, jeez. I don't want a guy nicknamed Thumbs building my house. If it's all the same <laughs> you better have the whole hand, right? What the hell happened to your house? Well, <laughs> Thumbs built it. <laughs> no thumbs up for him, huh? Yeah, yeah. So that's wow. how that happened. Okay. And but all of the all of the big moments in my life really happened in Montreal. Like I got married when I was there, and uh, my daughter was born there. Um, and then eventually we left to go back to Niagara, which is my hometown when Bob got an opportunity to be a GM at some of the stations there. And then I did one more year of radio after that. And then I left it completely. Okay. So, uh, Ted, uh, you, you started off on show. I believe the, uh, the pa peppermint Patty was on with, uh, with, with uh, Terry Damani. She had left and I believe Cindy Aikman had come in, right? Yeah. And then you came in like right after that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, shortly after that, I guess, in 1988. And I came on board as the news guy after uh, Gord Logan left. Uh, Gord Logan, the voice of God. Um, <laughs> talk, about, talk about a guy who would roll in uh, right straight from being out all night into work and still sound like a million bucks, boy. Nobody could do that like Gord Logan. <laughs> and... Uh, so yeah, so and I started as the news guy, and then and then sort of became, uh, you know, a, a co-host, and then uh, I guess it really morphed into Terry and Ted when we moved over to Mix in 1992. Okay, so uh, all right, so we're we're about to show uh, the clip, the little segment that revision is history, folks. I am telling you, get ready, strap on your seatbelts. This is a thunderous, thunderous. Uh, uh, revisionist history you guys are going to love but before we go into that uh, Kim right now you're not into radio anymore right or do you make some appearances uh, once in a while um, yeah I participate in roundtable uh, at 610 CKTB which is the Bell version of CJD but in Niagara so all still the same company um, yeah I'm on there every other Monday night and just to talk about news and views and that sort of thing and then I'll do interviews with uh, print, digital, radio, TV throughout, um, well, throughout the days, I guess, when I do uh, work for Pathstone. So Pathstone is, a, as I mentioned off the top, a children's mental health organization, and we support children from birth to their 18th birthday. And we're, we've been very busy, as you can imagine, through the pandemic, dealing with a lot of different struggles that kids are having through this time. So the PR side of it is, and communication side of it is just as busy as the fundraising side of it for me these days. 
Okay, so folks, uh, prepare some questions because I'm sure Ted and uh, Kim are going to be delighted uh, to answer your questions. Uh, you want to go back and, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, any questions, I'm sure our guests are going to be more than happy to oblige. Uh, Ted, uh, there's no, uh, the joke translator, I haven't heard from him in a long time. Yeah. What happened to him? Well, he's uh, he works in Toronto now. He's a big shot. He hosts the morning show at CFRB Toronto, which is... Uh, probably uh the premier radio talk show seat in the country oh, wow yeah okay all right so folks stand by we're going to be playing revisionist history i'm telling you i'm warning you get get ready for a good time let there be no more wars or bloodshed between arabs and israelis never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. Grenades are useful for their purpose, but they are no substitute for brains. A big sack of stupid. And now, Revisionist History with Ted Bird and Clovis Pova on K103 Gahnawage and K103radio.com. Well, good morning. It's Tuesday, May 25th. Good morning, Ted. Morning, Java. Today in Revisionist History, on this date in 1918, Canadian women were granted the right to vote and voted to get new hats. <laughs> I've used that before, and I'm going to keep using it till somebody laughs. <laughs> A subsequent referendum on matching purses was overwhelmingly rejected at the urging of noted suffragette Nellie McClung, who thought the struggle, struggle for gender equality would be better served by carrying her personal items in a hockey bag. <laughs> Cripes, Nelly, you might want to air that thing out. That'd knock a buzzard off a manure pile. <laughs> and your hockey bag stinks too. Wow. <laughs> 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 Well, that was worth the drive, wasn't it? <laughs> wow. Now this. <laughs> We sell the radio business. If you put that on the radio, people will listen to it. <laughs> two tickets, one of them on the radio. We're going to have a ball. In three, two, one. K103. Ted, talk to your producer. I'm coming to work with you tomorrow morning. <laughs> Those guys were a great studio audience. That was a bit choppy on my end. I hope you were able to hear that all right. Were you, Kim? It was. It was. Perfect. It was. Oh, my God. It was. <laughs> Who's this big, almost like Terry sounding laugh? In that studio, that's Lance Galil. Oh, oh it's the best! Yeah, he's got a great <laughs> laugh. Those guys, I had so much fun working over there. You know, when I left Shom, I went to Ganawage, which is for oh. people who don't know, it's a Mohawk territory outside of Montreal. And uh, you know, when 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 a white boy comes into Ganawage, people notice, right? It's like, mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, what are you doing here? Kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, but but by the time I left. Uh, and I'll tell you, this is, if someone says to me, what's the most, if you had to pick out one memorable moment from your career, what would it be? I would say it was a few months before I left K103 in Ganawage, and I was going into uh, the little coffee shop on the main drag uh, in town, and uh, a guy, uh, actually, I was coming out, and the guy and his teenage son were going in, and the guy said hello to me. And I said, hello. And as I passed them, I heard him say to his son, that's Ted Bird. He's part of our community now. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. And that's something, boy. If you, know, if you know natives and if you know Mohawks in particular, they're proud, proud people. Mm -hmm. And to be able to crack that nut like that meant everything. Hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, and once you're in the territory, you might want not want to make a, a revisionist history joke uh, pertaining to you know Mohawk Mohawk territory there. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Be the no. best idea. And so, Ted, we have our first question. This is from our listener. He's tuning in from England. 
<laughs> Sir Hello, Michael <laughs> what, the Englishman, what did the Englishman say when he came home and found his wife in bed with three guys? <laughs> what? Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> oh, my God. That's a big okay. Mary joke. <laughs> yeah, he would say it a little different, yeah, for sure. Oh, my God. So the question from Michael in England is the following. What tips do you have for interviewing people? Well, preparation is big. And also, listen to what the person is saying during the interview. Pay mm -hmm. attention to what's going on during the interview so that you can roll with the conversation. Because if you're too busy thinking about what's my next question going to be or, you mm -hmm. know, what am I going to have for dinner later on or I wonder if the wife's still mad at me, you'll, you'll miss it. You'll miss what's happening in the interview. So as long as you're focused in, then it becomes less of an interview and more of a discussion it just flows it's like a you know a good con a good interview is like a good conversation it should just flow as this has so <laughs> far tonight yeah yeah well, i think um i think just being aware of the subject matter for sure but not being overly prepared because i think you get disappointed if you script too much you get disappointed with what you didn't ask because you had it scripted, but yeah, like you miss it, opportunities, you, right? You miss Kim? the opportunity for yeah. the goal. You might ask one question and the rest will just naturally happen because of this great connection you have and, and that natural ability to act. Well, we call it active listening. Yeah. Uh, so Ted, uh, you're not from the Montreal area. You're really originally from the Maritimes, I believe. Yeah. From Fredericton. Okay, so uh, when you were growing up, was there any indication that one day you may be, you know, you might have been a radio announcer? The only indication was I I, um, I had a, a George Carlin album when I was a kid called AMFM. And George Carlin did uh, a radio bit or a couple of radio bits on the album. And I knew them off by, I was a huge George Carlin fan. And I knew those routines off by heart. And I would often do them just to entertain my buddies if we were on like hockey road trips or baseball road trips or something like that. And uh, I did them in a uh, in a, a high school variety show one time. And a few people said to me, hey, you should be a radio announcer. And I never really gave it much thought, but I ended up taking a journalism course in uh, PEI. And uh, I got an internship at a radio station through that course. And then... They hired, but they liked what I did and the fact that I worked cheap. So they hired me and, uh, and, uh, 43 or four years later, uh, here I still am. Yeah. And you were saying you may have, you know, you may have been a journalist. You could have been like a, a TV reporter. Well, who knows if I'd gotten a, uh, if I, if I'd gotten an internship at a TV station, maybe I would have been a TV. If I'd gotten an internship at a newspaper, maybe I would have been a newspaper writer. It just so happened that, uh, you know, I, I uh, got uh, taken on by a radio station. So I think it worked out for the best. I guess I'm told I have a face for radio. <laughs> well, that's a joke we've heard a lot of times. You know, like I have some buddies and I, you know, we go back and forth with these jokes. <laughs> They're just jealous of how good looking we are, Robert. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Kim, okay, so you're originally from... Uh, from uh, Ontario, Niagara. Okay, yeah. so you come over to Montreal. Uh, of course, there's a there's a cultural difference as soon as you come here, right? I mean, there's a French language, there's some some different things. Did you have a hard time uh, adapting a little bit with the cultural difference when you came here to Montreal? So when I arrived in Montreal, it was the second week of January, and it was minus forty with the wind chill. Oh my god! <laughs> I'd never been to Montreal before, and I'm like, what the hell? And at the time, I had a Danier leather three quarter length coat. Like that is what I had, not these parkas that go from head to toe and the mitts. And so I'm, I, the first thing I tried to do is where do I find a parka? And then someone said, well, you, you should have been looking in October. And so I eventually went into Mark's work warehouse, which is now Mark's and bought the only thick coat I could find. And that's what I would wear for the next couple of months. When we arrived, we were living in an apartment in the same building as the radio station that had, um, Ted, I'll, I'll mention, as Danielle used to always say, bebets everywhere. Um, <laughs> bebets. Bebets. <laughs> um, and be bit. that's, yeah. Uh, so, but you're right about the culture shock for sure is definitely very different. But then I fell so in love with Montreal when we were leaving. I was bitter and very unhappy about the decision. I remember 
them saying, well, this is the plan A and, and this is, you know, you're going to go to uh, Niagara and Bob's going to do this and you're going to do that. And I'm like, well, what's the plan B? Well, there is no plan B. And I said, well, you better think of one because I don't plan on going anywhere. Um, so I reluctantly ended up leaving Montreal and it was a better decision for Bob than it was for me career wise. I can say that quite frankly, as anyone would guess, you know, you don't leave Montreal to go to Niagara to do radio, it's just it's backwards. You start in Niagara and get to Montreal, hopefully. Um, but when I finally, you know, got acclimatized to Montreal, it took probably about a year total and we were there eight. So, uh, and some of my best and most closest and, and closest friends, lifetime friends are from there. And I met them there. Uh, Kim, what would you qualify as your the greatest moment uh, on radio? And um, I'm just throwing the dice. I guess show must have been the best experience you've had on radio. Am I correct? Uh, yeah, show was a very, uh, it was, yeah, it was a great experience for sure. I felt like I was, um, you know, women in radio and especially in those roles, that morning show role to kind of break out. Ted, you could probably appreciate this too. To be able to break out of the news role to be something more, not something better per se, but because some news people are satisfied in that news role. But and then to be a female, to be able to do it as well and kind of, as they say, play with the boys um, was something that wasn't easy. And it wasn't uh, and most hosts weren't super open to it. Uh, there was always a little bit of apprehension. So I will say about, you know, Ted and Terry, I kind of like landed and they said, this is who you're working with now. And. And they just bought in and, and we all had re respect for everybody's, you know, professionalism and craft. And I really felt, you know, in addition to my time with Steve Anthony, when it comes to a morning show and working with a trio. Yeah, that was the best, best radio experience I'd ever had. Terry's a good morning man because he lets the people around him shine. He doesn't he doesn't have to be the star of the show. You know, yeah. his ego doesn't uh, doesn't demand that. Uh, OK, I'm going to be like he, he, he says, I'm going to be the quarterback. But and as as well, he should, because that's his role. But he has no qualms about letting the people around him shine because he realizes that makes the show better. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's all about the show. It's not yeah. about any one person. It's about the show. And that's mm -hmm. why he's been so successful for so long. And that's why, quite frankly, right now, it's driving him crazy that he doesn't have anyone to work with. He's got Esteban there, his producer, mm -hmm. but it's not the same as having a co-host. They took away uh, uh, Heather. Yeah. And uh, they sort of left him on his own. And, and he's, uh, you know, he's he's a little bit bored because he doesn't have, it's just not as fun. It's not as fun when you don't no. have, you know, the dynamic of, of a co-host or co-hosts in yeah. the room. But that's the direction that the business is going in. So, um, okay. Um, I, for one, uh, I've been listening to radio for a long time. And uh, one thing's for sure, the dynamic that we had back then with, the three of you compared to what's going on today, you know, like you said, it's just not the same anymore. And I'm sure perhaps um, a lot of people got turned off by that. And maybe they're like switching to other avenues. Maybe they're going on like, uh, what, do, what do they call it? Serious radio, uh, other, uh, other kind of radio. So uh, it wasn't exactly a beneficial thing to take away co-hosts because I think that it works. You know, it, there's this dynamic that's missing nowadays. Well, they're doing it to save money, and but, uh, and I, you know, I think they're cutting off their nose to spite their face. I think I think they should be playing to their strengths, uh, but they're not. And it's not my money, and I'm not a shareholder. And it's all about you know the share price and 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 everything like that. But you know, I always thought radio's strength was that it's it's local and it's immediate, and um, and, and you know when you get uh, local people. Uh, on the air, you know, talking to you, with you, having a good time, having a laugh, keeping mm -hmm. it intensely local. I think that really works. That little radio station I work at right now out in Hudson, uh, the Jewel, I work with Tom Whalen, who lives in Hudson. And Tom and I have the same dynamic. And when Murray Sheriff spills in for Tom, which he did this morning, we have the same dynamic that that uh, Terry and I and, and, uh, and Kim had. It's mm -hmm. we laugh all morning long mm -hmm. and it's off the cuff and it's local and it's fun and it's not just it's you're not going to get that on satellite radio because satellite radio is not local you're not going to get that on a streaming service because the streaming service is only music it doesn't have personalities mm -hmm. on it so i think that i think that at that little radio station i'm at now we really play to radio strengths and i think little radio little local radio stations are the future of radio i think 
because well, in, in, you know, the, in the larger markets, they're just they're just carving them to pieces. Here's a story for you, Kim. You'll appreciate this. Yeah. Uh, Simon Dingley, who's a friend of mine who worked in Montreal at CTV for many years and has been back in Toronto where he's from as a reporter, TV reporter for uh, Global for a while and now CBC. Simon told me the other day, he actually posted this on Twitter at CFRB in Toronto, which is the number one talk radio station in the country, mm -hmm. and which when I was coming up was hallowed ground. Like if you mm -hmm. if you worked at CFRB, you, you know, you were, and even Kim, when you were coming up years later, it was still like CFRB, that was the shit, man. I started there, man. Like that was the place you want, it was the beacon. This past Saturday morning on their eight o'clock news on the sports report, they didn't mention the Leafs score. The Leafs had mentioned that they had played the night before and they neglected to mention the Leaf score on the sports on CFRB at eight o'clock the next morning. Because it's pre-canned. And the following morning, they didn't have sports at all. Ooh. And so, it would be it would be disgraceful if it wasn't so sad. Yeah. No, and I think you, you hit it, Ted, probably a few minutes ago when you said, you know, it's local, but it's personality. So, like, years ago when I was in uh, Ottawa doing a rock morning show there, Pat Holiday called me, and he called a number of other people, too. And he said, we're bringing personality radio back. And we want you to be part of this show in Toronto. And that's when I went back to Toronto for the second time and worked at Mix and CFRB. And it was based on that. They wanted people that were personalities to be on radio again. And, I, and, and so we got to that point where it was stripped away and then built up again to only be stripped away once again. Yeah, and I don't think I don't think it's coming back this time because no. of the internet and because guys like Pat Holliday are no longer in the business. Pat's happily retired, which is a shame. You know, the business needs more Pat Holidays. Yeah, and Gary Slates and yep. like, like all of those people that were part of the fabric of radio. Yeah, but if I was Gary Slate and somebody said to me, "I'll give you a billion dollars for your radio stations," I'd probably take the billion and go away too. Absolutely, but not that he didn't sacrifice the product when he sold at that at that time, right? He. he the, the conversations with regards to what Astral had planned was pretty much to preserve what he was doing, which I think they did for quite a while. Well, and then they Not sold, all the way and then they and then they sold to Bell. I mean, the, yeah, the right. beginning the beginning of the end for radio as we knew it was when families like the Waters family at Chum and the mm -hmm. Slate family at Standard sold to corporations, namely Chorus and Bell. And, you know, the people at Chorus, the people who run Chorus and Bell are very good at what they do, but what they do is they slash and burn to make money and the product suffers. So mm -hmm. the, the nice thing about working for the Slates and the Waters families, and I worked for both, was that they were professional broadcasters. And so they, they understood both ends of the business and they knew that, you know, uh, that the, the two ends of the business massaged each other. You know, right. if you had a good product, sales were good. If sales were good, you could afford to put on a good product. So, but now yeah. it's just all, now it's just all about, you know, burn it down and, 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 and get that share price up. Shareholders, yeah. Well, like I was saying before, you helped shape the lives of many people. And like I said, I'm one of them. And, you know, uh, you have such an impact on people and you probably don't realize it because people relate to you personally, individually, and as a team. And so uh, on behalf of all the people you have touched, including myself, because you can't hear them, but I, I know that they're thinking the same thing I am. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this as a personal thing as well. I'd like to thank you guys very much for having touched the lives, our lives in a very positive way, because um, like myself, a lot of people would get up in the morning and the first thing, the first instant they had is turn on the radio right away while they're making the coffee. They go take a shower, they get dressed. It was on all, you know, all, all through, get into the car, go to work. And it was shown with Terry, Ted and Kim. So guys, thank you so much for having made my life so much better and everybody's life in Montreal and abroad. <laughs> Cats off to both of you. What was the bus route that you were on when you listened to show Okay, uh, let me see. Okay, that was a Brossard route. I was on the south shore okay. of Montreal. It was the route number thirty. Okay, so, that, so that that's was... pretty. That's Brossard's pretty good mix of English and French, isn't it? Exactly. It had a lot of uh, a lot of uh, ethnic background uh, people, uh, and uh, this a lot of them speak English, and a lot of French speaking people tune mm -hmm. in to Shom as well because the music was so good. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, Shom's mm -hmm. listenership was always 
I think, more French than it was English. Yeah, you know, as funny as that may seem, but I would remember I would have a crowd, and my bus was full, but they would, like, gather around just so that they could hear the radio better, and I would, like, put up the volume, and they were just, like, waiting for you to come on with your revisionist history, and the laughter was contagious. It's like we were all laughing in the bus. It was it was crazy. And then, uh, of course, you know, when uh, Kim had a little segment, you know, people were tuning in. It was just, it was so good. It was like so family oriented. It's like it was a part of our lives. We needed that. Just like having your cereal in the morning. We needed to have the three, the the trio from Shom. You were just so vital to our existence. Well, it was, you know, our job, first of all, but we had a, a great time doing it. Um, and, I, and the other part of it, too, all three of us were really heavily involved in the community. We were involved in different charities. We were emceeing. We were at fundraisers and events and giving others a platform to be able to expose what they were, you know, trying to do for the community as well. So, you know, it was an honor for us, too, to be able to, you know, afford that uh, to others for so many years. Well, you know what? Uh, is it me or we don't see much of that anymore? Uh, radio announcers getting involved with the community. Uh, I don't know if Terry is still involved with the Montreal Children's Hospital. Uh, what was it? The Telethon? We, what did, was that, it exactly? we did that annual uh, children's uh, telethon at, at uh, Chio. Chio? No. Uh, yeah, children, at the Children's no. Hospital. Right? Yeah, so what do they call it here? Shum. Montreal, with the Montreal yeah. Children's, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Ted, you're also a fantastic comedian besides being a radio announcer. Do you actually do some stand-up comedy? Yeah, I don't do it on a regular basis, but uh, quite often I'll MC shows. I'll be asked to MC shows, usually something like a charity show or something like that. Or if there's an Irishman, if there's an Irish event uh, uh, over the St. Patrick's Day uh, uh, festivities, I'll be asked to either be one of the one of the performers or to, or to MC the show. There hasn't been as much of that lately because of the pandemic. There hasn't been a whole lot of live okay. comedy. I did a show uh, this past St. Patrick's Day, like last month, but it was it was an online show, so there was no live audience. It was I was performing to an empty. Well, Tom was there, my co-host. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I was performing to an empty room, which was kind of, which wasn't too bad for me because it's what I do anyway, right? Every morning I sit there in a room with Tom and I tell jokes and the <laughs> laughter is assumed. Right. Hmm. Okay. So Ted, is comedy, you know, if you had a chance to do some comedy, is that something you would consider? Well, I'm too old now. It's a young man's game, a very young man's game comedy. Um uh, but I, I enjoy doing it just for fun, you know, just for fun. And, and you know, if it puts a couple of bucks in my pocket at the okay. same time, uh, fantastic. Um, it's uh, the, the comedy business itself. Um, I don't know if I'd want to be part of that right now, because like so much of media right now, it's so uh, overrun with the woke crowd. Right. And comedians that like they're, they're there's, you know, like almost uh, What's the, there's a word for it, inter, inter next, and I forget the word, but there's like, there's a war within the comedy community between people who say, listen, funny is funny. Okay. And people who say, oh, you can't say that because yeah. it's offensive and you can't say that because you might offend this group. And you can't say that because you might offend that group. If that's your attitude, you shouldn't be in comedy because the audience will decide what's funny and what isn't funny. And I don't think I would be able to take the backstage debates that must go on. The politicking. Uh, that, the politicking yeah, within no. the comedy community. My favorite comedian right now is a guy named Tim Dillon. I saw him uh, in Burlington, Vermont last fall. And he's got a big following and he's getting bigger all the time on social media. And he's got his own <laughs> podcast. He's been on the Joe Rogan podcast a couple of times. Yeah. He's he's a he's a gay conservative <laughs> from Long Island, New York, and wow. he doesn't give a shit. <laughs> and he's really, really edgy and he's yeah. really, really funny. And when I he's and he's also a lot of the smart comedians will when they're done their show at a club, they'll stand at the door and thank everybody as they leave. And as mm -hmm. I was leaving, I said to him, I think you're one of the most important voices in comedy today and not one of the funny. Like I didn't say I think one of your, yeah. you're one of the funniest guys, which I do. 
but yeah. I said to him, I think you are one of the most important voices in comedy today. Mm -hmm. And he understood what I was saying and he appreciated that. What's his name again? Tim Dillon. Tim Dillon. Yeah, he does, if you think of it, D-I-L-L-O-N. If you mm -hmm. think of it, look up on, I'm doing it look now. Up on the internet, his skit. Where, <laughs> <laughs> he does this skit where he he's uh, Megan, uh, Megan, is it Megan McCain, who was who's John McCain's daughter, who's on The View? Oh, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, I think it's Megan McCain. He does a Megan McCain skit that is so vile and dirty yeah. and cruel I... and funny. Yeah. It just it just knocked me right off my chair the first time I saw it. But it's the kind of thing that a lot of comedians now would go, oh, he shouldn't do that because right. that's going to hurt someone's feelings. Too bad. It's funny. Oh, wow. <clears throat> so I got him on Twitter now. I got him on Twitter. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there you go. And watch his watch his Boomer Thanksgiving skit too. He did a skit a couple of years ago about uh, <laughs> baby Boomer Thanksgiving with the baby Boomer parents and their two nihilistic children who come home for uh, for uh, Thanksgiving, and he plays the parts of all four. He's just a scream. He's a huge okay. talent. Huge talent. Uh, so Kim, uh, you, you've done some voice work as well because. Uh, uh, well, both of you have amazing radio voices, and that's why you guys have been in the business for so long. But you've done some uh, voice work, uh, Kim, uh, for commercials, I believe, right? Uh, just a little bit. I, I really actually get a kick out of still going into the station locally when we could. And just when I was in to do roundtables saying, hey, do you have any commercials you need me to voice just for a change of scenery for them? And they liked it, and I liked it too. But um, I haven't done paid voice work in a really long time. I've just... Yeah, I'm 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 still aware of the business, but I'm not really in it anymore. But Ted's got like Ted, I remember your Reno Depot commercials like it was yesterday. You know what? I've been doing I haven't heard from them in about six months because of the pandemic, right? Oh. And I hope that it's not the end of the ride. But even if it is, I yeah. did Reno Depot since two thousand five. Yeah. Reno yes, Depot. I remember. Yeah. The the I was the English voice of Reno Depot mm -hmm. for, for fifteen years. Yeah. And um, and boy, oh boy, that's an awfully good run. And in, in, you know, when it comes to doing voice work, if, if you can attach yourself to a company for that long, uh, like I say, I hope it comes back because I could use the money. Uh, <laughs> but but even, even if it doesn't, I'm grateful that I had a, a run that was that long. Yeah. So, um, Kim, um, where did you train? Uh, you know, to become a radio announcer, or, or actually, okay, hang on, let's start from the beginning. Yeah. You you were growing up. And you, you had some kind of an interest in some kind of form of communications. What was your first love? Law. I actually wanted to be a lawyer. And, you know, nobody was surprised by that because I could keep a good argument or make a good argument, I should say, um, or at least offer a different perspective. But when I was making my fake ID and having it laminated <laughs> at, at Jumbo Video, true story, um, I did say that I was at St. Jerome College in the broadcasting program. And so I'm 16 going over the river, which is to the States. That's the language they use in Niagara to get into bars when I shouldn't have been there. And that's, that's the fake ID I had. So fast forward to English media, grade 12, we did a chapter on radio and that was it. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be on the radio. And I went to Mohawk college for two years and uh, graduated from that program and started at CFRB 1010. Actually, that was my first job. And didn't look back after that. That job at CFRB opened every single door for me after that. Okay, so you're both at Shom, and all of a sudden, uh, the, 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 there came an end to the awesome tandem we had here in Montreal, Terry, Ted, and Kim. So uh, who was first to leave in the trio? Uh, obviously, Terry stayed behind, but between uh, mm -hmm. you and uh, uh, Ted, who, who was the, uh, the first one to leave? Well, Terry was the first to go. He left in yeah. 2007. He went out in Cal. He went out to Calgary. Okay, you and Kim were still there when he left. Yeah, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And and who replaced Terry when he left? Rob Kemp initially. Mm -hmm. And then okay. Pete, and then Pete Marier. Rob Kemp was doing the uh, traffic on the helicopter, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So so then Rob Kemp ca came in, and then afterwards, who was next to leave? Um. So Ro well, Rob, Rob, Rob uh, they moved Rob out and moved Pete Marier in. Yeah. Okay. 
and then uh, and then Kim and Bob left, and then I left after that. Okay, so once you left, uh, Kim, you went back to uh, your homeland in Ontario. And yeah, at that I did, moment, I did mornings at ninety-seven-seven in Niagara. Oh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> Rock Station in Niagara. That's also ninety-seven-seven. Yeah. Okay. And and uh, Ted, what was your journey after you left Shom? That's that's when I went to Ganawagi. Okay, you went to Ganawagi, and then yeah. from there, I believe you're also you were also on CTV. You were doing the sports, weren't you? Well, I was doing a sports commentary. Okay. Yeah, I wasn't anchoring the sports. I did a sports commentary on CTV for I guess about a year or so, and then I worked at uh, TSN six ninety on the morning show there uh, until uh, the the uh, sh uh, Bell and Astral merger. And at that point, the guy who was running Shom when I quit Shom became my new boss. And his first order of business was to show me the door. Oh, so okay. I, um, so I, uh, I worked at a little country station over in Ganawagi for about a year. And then the jewel came along. And I've been there since 2015. It was six years last month. Hmm. Well, it looks as if you had a lot of fun at K103, Ted. Uh, oh, we had a ball over there. That was an absolute hoot. That was one of the... That was one of the uh, uh, greatest experiences of my life from from many perspectives, not least of which is the one I told you about, about being being accepted into that community. And I still yeah. have great friends in that community. And I used to go, you know, before I worked there, I would go to Ganawagi with a little bit of trepidation, you know, geez, do I really want to? I have no problem going into Ganawagi now, nor should anyone else, as long mm -hmm. as you comport yourself as a decent person. And uh, show the respect that you would show uh, to anyone else, anywhere else. Right. Uh, I have I have great friends in Ganawage. I'm a big New York Giants football fan, and Ganawage is full of Giants fans. Okay. And so every year for the season opener, uh, my son and I go over to Mike DeLille's house. Mike is the grand. I don't know if Mike's still the grand chief, but he was the grand chief. And he's got this New York giant shrine in his basement that's unbelievable. It's like nothing I've ever seen. It's like a museum. So we go over there every day, every year, and uh, get together with the other Giants fans and watch the Giants lose the season opener and cry in our beers and uh, <laughs> go on our way. But yeah, I, I, I uh, you know, I have some regrets about leaving Shom. I probably should have stuck around and and made them push me out rather than, you know, help rather than just say, you know, don't you know who I think I am? Fuck mm -hmm. you and leave. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but but that Ganawage experience was. Uh, you know, when I when I look back on everything that that was uh, that was you know that was a life changer for me and and in a very good way. Okay, well we'll start with Kim because I have the same question for both of you. Kim, what is the most memorable experience you hold to this day in the world of radio? What, what is that like? Just like blew you away, and that today you think back at this, and you say, "Wow." Oh God, Robert! I don't know. You know, I, I and I'll and I'll. It'll come to me obviously after we're done uh, tonight. But you know, like I said to you, I met some of my best friends through the radio station. So Teresa Deller, um, the late Teresa Deller from West Island Palliative Care, I met through Shom. Uh, Paul Angie Skavich, who was uh, the head of the foundation at the Royal Vic, I met at Shom, and those are. To, and they led me to countless other people that I'm still friends with. Like those are two of the most, you know, impactful and relevant and important women that you know helped shape me uh, for what I do now. Like as a fundraiser, ironically, because they were both fundraisers at the time, and now that's what I do for a living. Um, and actually, when I was thinking about doing fundraising, Paul Ann's the one that hired me, and Teresa's the one I called to ask if she thought I could do it, and. Uh, I wouldn't have ever met those people had I not been doing the job that I was doing at Shom and radio specifically. So all of the people that I've met through my life and work in radio, those to me are the moments that last a lifetime. And Kim, who would you say, uh, because even though you're on the radio, uh, you know, you always have people you look up to. So who would you say are the uh, announcers that you looked up to and maybe even still look up to today that helped you shape your career as an announcer? Well, I didn't, uh, there's a couple of newscasters that I, you know, started working with at CFRB, but I really love John Oakley, who's still on the air at 640 now in Toronto. Um, I just liked his the casual style, but I love talk radio. Like that was my very first love was talk radio. 
Um, you know, I liked Bill Carroll for a really good number of years when I was much younger um, as well. Those were kind of, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, favor music radio as much as I did talk radio. So those were kind of two of the, the people, but I listen to John Moore every single morning. I don't miss a morning of CFRB. I, I, I'm there every single morning. Wow. And uh, how about you, Ted? Uh, who, I know you were saying that you were back in New Brunswick. You didn't really have anyone like to look up to, but you know, you came here to show them. And uh, I'm sure, you know, while your career was uh, shaping up, did you have like somebody that uh, influenced you in the business that you looked up to and probably e even still today, do you look up to someone, you know, well, someone there, that there are two people. And one of them, I, I actually saw on Facebook today that he was celebrating a birthday. He was the news director at CFTR in Toronto. When I started working there in 1979, I was 20 years old and I didn't know shit from shine. Ola. Mm -hmm. And this guy, his name was Robert holiday. And he, uh, he even looked like Stalin. He was really, really scary. And he scared the shit out of me. And he yelled at me a couple of times. And I thought I was going to cry. Um, but he taught me things that I still practice on a daily basis 41 years later. He uh, at just small fundamental uh, uh, broadcasting um lessons that I that I still apply to this day and I'll, I'll always remember him and the other one is Terry I learned a ton just sitting across the desk from Terry day after day for however many years we worked together 20 years or whatever it was Terry's the the best natural broadcaster I've ever seen mm -hmm. and uh, I learned a ton just watching him work and working with him every day okay so uh my god you know you're right Ted this hour has flown flown right by. Mm -hmm. So with the little time that we have, uh, let's start with Kim. If you have any advice for anybody getting into the radio business today in today's reality, do you yeah. do you suggest going into podcasting first and then you make a move? Um, you know, there's as Ted said, there, there's definitely still fundamentals to be learned in school from you know to get a bit of a some formal training. I don't know if I recommend a four year university, but definitely a two-year college. I taught at Niagara College for a number of years once I got back to Niagara, first and second year broadcasting students and radio students um, and TV students, actually. But, um, you know, I, you, you really have to, you know, start at that ground level. Like, you have to be the promo person and you have to, you know, be willing to be the op and, and that sort of stuff, I think. Um, but I just don't know how open the market is anymore for for new personalities. Podcasts would definitely be the way to go, I think, just from the fundamentals of interviewing and setting up a show and realizing how much work it is. Like we don't just turn on the microphone and start talking. It's it's planned in advance, at least the general idea of, you know, who's starting this and how are we getting in and how are we getting out and, you know, being able to have that chemistry. And I so relate to what you're saying, Kim. Yes, podcasting is very, uh, it's very difficult, very demanding. But at the end of the day, it's the funnest thing I, I'm seeking for myself that I could possibly be doing. It is great. And there's also the web series I'm part of with uh, our uh, producer and our techie, which is another fantastic experience that, you know, it's a lot of fun. So uh, let's give Ted a chance to answer as well. What's the advice that you have for someone starting off in the radio business? Well, podcasting is fun, but if you go to the bank and you say, hey, I've got this fun, um, <laughs> they're just going to kind of give you a look and go, oh, yeah, what else have you got? Well, it's fun. So my son is uh, my son's in the Ryerson Sports Media Studies program, and it would not have been my first choice for him, but it's what he wants to do. So I'm encouraging him. If it's what you want to do, then you do it. But I've warned him, as Kim just said, when I started out, and it might have been the same when Kim started out, which would have been years after me, but when I started out, there were jobs for everybody. Yeah. When I worked at CFTR in Toronto, it was a top 40 music station, and there were 25 people in the newsroom in the newsroom mm -hmm. at a top 40 music station, 25 people. CFTR is now 680 News, which is the biggest all news radio station in the country. And I'll bet you they don't employ 25 people in total. Mm -hmm. So there just aren't at nearly as many jobs. It's, it's highly, highly competitive and more and more jobs are being cut all the time. Mm -hmm. Podcasting is great if you want to, uh, if you want to learn, 
and uh, and get experience. And that's what Sam's doing. Him and uh, my son, him and one of his buddies, they have their own uh, hockey podcast called Press Box Chatter. And it's really good and it's really funny, but they're mm-hmm. not making a penny off it. So what they've got to do is they got to figure out how do we monetize this podcast or how do we use this podcast as a springboard yeah. into paying jobs in broadcasting? Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's a really, really tough business right now. Yeah. Really, really tough. Mm-hmm. But let's I, wouldn't want to be, I wouldn't want to be looking for a job in radio right now. No, I'm glad I'm at the end and not at the beginning. Okay. Um, Ted, uh, Kim, do I reserve two tickets for you? Because uh, next week we have an interesting podcast and we have someone that you know quite well that's going to be our guest. So uh, do you uh, get the front row? Where do you want to sit, front row, middle, or the back? What is all this about tickets? You just took my monetizing uh, thing to heart, eh? (laughs) Hey, a guy's got to make a buck, right? Yeah. (laughs) Well, actually, the reason why I'm telling you that is because Heather Backman is going to be our guest next week. At the same time, same place. So you both know her quite well. Yeah. So I would take you. Chances are you're probably going to be tuning in to say hello to, uh, to Heather. Sure. Uh, Ted and Kim, I, I ask you, can you please uh, stay? Because uh, we're going to be signing off the show. And we're going to have a meet and greet with the producer and the, pod, uh, the, the podcast, uh, Techie. So, you know, I'll give you guys uh, a chance to sign off and say bye to the audience. If there's anything you want to say before we sign off. Uh, just thanks for having us, and let me give you a score in the hockey game. Two-one <laughs> Edmonton. Oh, that's not good news. E. Yeah, well, lots <laughs> so, of time left. Lots of time left. <laughs> so, guys, stay behind. We're gonna be coming to get you. All right. Okay. Okay. Well, there you have it, folks. Those were our guests tonight. It was Ted Bird and Kim Rossi, a former uh, radio uh, station uh, personalities at Show 97.7 FM. Uh, they helped shape the lives of many people. It was absolutely fantastic to have them on. And now, well, you know, life goes on, but the memory survives. So once again, just letting you know, next week, our guest is going to be Heather Backman. Stay tuned. So thank you to all for having tuned in. And uh, on behalf of myself, uh, Patty and Jenny, good night. God bless you. And we'll see you next week with Heather Backman. Ciao.